afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, 2017 Proxy Season Recap. Today's event is sponsored by the KPMG Board Leadership Center and powered by OnStream Media. Please be advised that today's discussion is being recorded and will be available on demand later this afternoon. Additionally, we have a number of media representatives attending today's webinar. Pursuant to Chatham House rules, while the media is free to use the information from the discussion, we would ask that the media representatives seek permission from any panelists they would like to attribute a quote to. We are hoping to make this discussion as lively and interactive as possible and welcome your questions throughout the discussion. You can either send us a question using the Ask a Question button on the bottom of your screen or via Twitter using the hashtag ProxySeason. At this point, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's discussion, Stephen L. Brown, Senior Advisor at the KPMG Board Leadership Center. For some introductory remarks, Stephen, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to all on this uh, August 1st. Um, and what we plan to do today and this is part two to what we did in the spring when we opened up proxy season, which is to talk about lessons learned and, uh, and key insights from this, this year's proxy season. And uh, there are those out there, those on the phone um, um, who are panelists and, uh, and others out there who do a wonderful job in, in writing volumes uh, and giving some uh, particular detailed insights on numbers. Uh, we're, we're going to slightly avoid that today and talk about trends um, because we think that's sort of the key insight here. And uh, particularly with the, the number of years of experience that we have with the panelists represented here. Um, uh, and I'm going to introduce our panelists, then we, we will uh, uh, spend the bulk of our time um, after some other introductory remarks talking about the trends and issues for discussions with our panelists and then end with uh, key takeaways and lessons learned from this year's proxy season and have a, a moment for Q&A. That said, we will have a moment for Q&A at the end of our session, uh, but, it, but we encourage you, as our, our introductory remark uh, were said earlier, um, to submit your questions, and uh, as those questions come in, um, um, I will see them and uh, be able to, if they fit right into the flow, I'll get them right in. Uh, if not, we'll do it at the end of our session here. Um, now our, our great panelists, starting with Amy Boris, Deputy Director of the Council of Institutional Investors, and, and Amy brings a tremendous amount of experience to this discussion. Um, um, as Deputy Director, um, she represents the Council of Institutional Directors. Uh, founded in 1985, a nonpartisan, nonprofit association of public union, corporate employee, and endowments, and, and other investor members. Uh, their members include a range of asset man managers with uh, assets well over 20 million. Um, she does everything and anything at the council. Um, she's a good friend, and, 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 and uh, one of the things that she does um, is lead the CII's proxy voter group. Um, which is a form of senior governance advisors at 75 leading institutional investor organizations, um, among the many different things that she does at, at the CII um, based in Washington, D.C. And thank you for joining us, Amy. Uh, we also have, uh, these are all good friends that, who I've lined up. Uh, uh, Keith Godfrey, uh, who he and I go back uh, to law practice quite some time ago, he is now uh, very, very famously part of um, uh, a leading, uh, the market leading shareholder activism defense practice at Morgan Lewis. Uh, prior to Morgan Lewis, uh, Keith was a partner in a couple of different uh, international law firms. He's resident in D.C., as is Amy. And uh, I, I should note that uh, Keith's experience is not, is, is not simply um, in private law firm world. Uh, he was under President Bush, uh, uh, general counsel of HUD. Um, and uh, so he has a tremendous amount of uh, experience leading a number of lawyers in that division and in working in the White House or and with the White House. Um, uh, and uh, Keith and I, as I said, uh, alluded to earlier, um, uh, spent some time at another leading international law firm uh, doing M&A work. Uh, thank you for joining us 
Keith. Uh, and lastly is Mark Carnett, who is a founding partner of Strategic Governance Advisors. Um, and uh, Mark, uh, again, brings a tremendous amount of experience as an advisor to boards and the C-suite on shareholder issues, uh, ranging from proxy contests to tender offers to, to mergers. He uh, has a deep experience in uh, leading strategy, uh, doing uh, what I like to be uh, like to call sort of times of crisis related to um, shareholder issues um, in leading his clients through that. So thank you, Mark, Keith, and Amy for joining us. And uh, as I said in the opening, uh, what, what I'd like to start out first doing is, uh, as, as what's done in any typical political campaign or, or the start of a political season, which is that you want to take a temperature of where your voters are. What's their disposition? Um, and so I'd like to think about uh, and talk, uh, open up with uh, the investor disposition starting at the start of proxy season in 2017. Uh, and much akin to the political season where, uh, you know, if, if you're a uh, uh, if you're a politician, you want to understand you know, where the heads are of voters and how do they feel, which is always a function of a number of themes, events, and pressures driven by macro trends. Um, and if I had to sum up you know, where the investor um, you know, was this year, um, you know, the, the key word that pops in my mind is assertive. Uh, the, the assertiveness was, was top of mind for me, and in some respects, in some cases, they're downright aggressive. And there's a, they, they were confident about asserting their rights, and uh, this is a function, I believe, of uh, and sh basically it's things that we should have expected given what has happened over the last 10 years, the last few years, and the beginning of this year. Referring to the last 10 years, uh, the increase of shareholder rights um, that has happened over the last decade, uh, and the decrease of corporate defenses, add with the increase of what I, what I term the awareness of shareholder power. Now, I believe shareholders have always had uh, the powers that, that have been imbued with them um, by law, um, but over the last decade, they've become more aware of it and, and, and have expressed themselves um, and have become aware of their ability to use that power. What we've also seen over the last decade is an increase in number of environmental and social ENS proposals, and that's always been the case for quite some time. Um, um, in the, uh, and as that has gone on over the last decade, the, uh, the awareness of those issues, whether or not you voted for them or against them, the awareness has grown year by year. And over the last few years, we've seen the incredible increase of the number of activists. Um, and the success of hedge fund activism. Um, and you add that with, as those years have gone on, the increased knowledge and information available to the proxy voter on uh, ENS issues. And then at the top of this year, Obviously, the change of administration um, was obviously a big deal in um, 2017, and the pronouncements from the administration of uh, a move towards deregulation, a de-emphasis on uh, climate change and other social-related issues, and that really pushed investors um, to think about that notion of private ordering and of using their own shareholder power to, to push change. And it also increased the constituents of those investors. And we often forget that those large institutional investors have constituents. Um, and uh, you know, the pressures that those constituents have put on, act, put on those institutional investors, when you combine that with uh, uh, the increase in activism and the success of activism, the increase in, in knowledge and information of environmental and social issues, um, and the last decade spent of decreasing corporate defenses and increasing shareholder rights and the realization of those powers, you sort of get a perfect storm that you arrive in 2017 where the uh, general investor disposition was one of being assertive and uh, focusing on uh, using your rights. So with that, uh, uh, some of the issues that we'll talk about today um, are obviously core governance issue, that G in the ESG. From um, really, uh, we saw the typical issues that you see every year in core governance, board declassification, majority voting, written consent, uh, but we'll focus uh, on uh, two in particular, uh, proxy access, and uh, one that's uh, a little bit of a surprise that uh, we probably weren't expecting, which, are, which is uh, the issue of the ability to amend bylaws. Then we'll jump into the next big theme, 
which was frankly environmental and social proposals were absolutely at the forefront um, of proxy season with Main Street asset managers flexing their muscles on the subject of the environment and board diversity. Uh, we'll move into talking about uh, hedge fund activism, which is alive and well, uh, with macro trend, mac the macro trend uh, continuing where we saw uh, the number of activists increase, uh, the number of, of uh, first-time first activists uh, going up also, and the number of campaigns um, which were led, which uh, did something for the first time, which really um, sort of were very aggressive and went r directly after the head of the CEO uh, without any without any pretension um, or lead-up, um, directly um, sort of pointing the finger at the leadership and going directly there. Uh, so we'll talk about activism, and then, and then we'll talk about um, something that has, that, that was, has been the uh, big issue this year and has made news even today, um, which is the issues of um, multi-class voting classes, um, from SNAP to Blue Apron um, to the index exchanges, um, taking note and making some decisions we'll talk about. Uh, we'll also talk about um, the rise of the virtual-only annual meetings and, and what we think that means for the future. And then we'll, you know, the, the last trend we'll talk about um, is again a function of having a new administration. Well, you have a new SEC and a new SEC chair who's come out uh, with some uh, uh, his speeches with the uh, agenda that he has, uh, and that comes on top of a number of legislative proposals that are out there, including um, the future of shareholder proposals is up and in the air and being debated now. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. So I will uh, want to first open up uh, to our panelists uh, the issue around proxy access, and we'll do that very quickly because I think the answer this year was well, that was the leading proposal last year. Uh, it wasn't this year, but it was still on the agenda, um, and it has basically become uh, the norm as a best practice to have you know, your three years uh, have proxy access instituted um, by private ordering you know, if for shareholders who have held it for three years. Uh, and have uh, um, at least 3%. Uh, the difference is sort of the nuances there. So I'll open it up to our panel to talk about, um, you know, what we saw in proxy access this year. Um, Stephen, this is Amy. I'll, I'll be happy to kick off because, yes, it was another big year for proxy access. And in terms of shareholder proposals filed, it, it was the most filed journal proposal the first six months of the year, but um, many of these proposals were withdrawn um, as companies um, agreed to adopt proxy access bylaws. It's interesting that about a half of those uh, proposals filed were sought an adoption of a proxy access bylaw at a company that didn't have one, and about half sought to amend an existing access bylaw. The former seemed to fare much, much better. And we're now in a world where, you know, uh, more than 400 companies have adopted um, uh, proxy access bylaws, and that includes more than 60 percent of the S&P 500. I, I think we're going to continue to see um, proxy – companies will continue to be engaging with their shareholders on this topic. I know the Office of the New York City Comptroller is in the lead, and, and they're increasingly – looking at um, kind of going down the corporate food chain, if you will, focusing, I guess, over time more on mid- and small-sized companies or maybe mid-sized com mid companies. Um, and um, just a plug for CII, because tomorrow we'll be releasing um, a proxy access guide to um, kind of best, best practices around proxy access. It updates a guide that we put out two years ago on this, and we'll just be talking it, – it just – lists and talks about um, CI's position on different kinds of uh, bylaw provisions that we've seen incorporated in uh, various, um, at various companies' proxy access mechanisms. Amy, it's uh, Mark, and I, I think there was sort of a, if you were a proponent of the proxy access proposals, uh, a, a bit of a perfect storm which um, uh, you know, in, in, in my experience, uh, was the fastest that something like this was ever adopted by corporations. I think, uh, on the one hand, uh, most companies uh, were advised that the writing was on the wall, that uh, any proxy access proposal that sort of was uh, garden variety, 3, 3, and 20, 25 percent, would be adopted by a majority of, of your shareholders. Um, but I think the, the, the second thing was that uh, also they were advised to try to get out ahead of the proposals and adopt it 
to the extent that they could uh, with, with certain bells and whistles that uh, might be a little bit more corporate friendly. And by adopting it ahead of time, not having uh, some, a, a form of proxy access uh, forced upon them. But I think also what was sort of critical with making companies comfortable with adopting proxy access is the understanding that it's not opening up the door to your tr what would be considered the mainstream activists that have been engaging uh, and, and nominating directors uh, on companies uh, over the last decade or so. In other words, the, the big name um, activists like uh, Elliot or Starboard, Carl Icahn, um, Third Point, et cetera, uh, probably are not going to be using proxy access, but using their um, their sort of tried and true method of filing opposition proxy materials. They're not going to use proxy access for a variety of reasons. Sometimes, the, a lot of times, because they don't meet the holding period of three years. But also, I, I think the bigger issue is that uh, proxy access actually may put some restrictions on the ability of the proponents to get the necessary information to conduct a proxy fight to their advantage. Um, and so I think most companies felt that by adopting proxy access, they weren't going to be just opening up the floodgates to a, a, a slew of activists that uh, would not normally have gone after them. That's true. We, we don't expect that if, when if proxy access is used, it'll be used by a hedge fund activist, or at least not in the lead. Um, but. It'll be more likely to be the thought when it is used, it'll be more likely a what would be considered a more socially oriented, environmental oriented activist, and that would be their agenda uh, potentially coming out of the public pension plan uh, community where they've held the stock for a long time and uh, can put together the, the requisite number of shares then to be able to meet the criteria to then nominate um, as opposed to an actual hedge fund. Uh, I, in speaking with various activist hedge funds over the years, you know, while most of them paid attention to the proxy access adoptions, none of them thought that they would be necessarily using it. Um, could be that we'll be talking next year and ahead of the proxy season or at the end of next year's proxy season, and I could be proved wrong on that, that statement, but that's not. But right now, it doesn't look like that's who's going to be using it. Right. It, it, maybe, if I could just caveat that, though, that, though, with the observation that it, even the largest public pension funds don't, commit, you know, don't control that many shares. It'll, it'll take a lot of aggregating to get to um, the 3% ownership threshold. and. It's possible that, um, in perhaps in some, at some case, in, in some example, um, a hedge fund activist might put the a nominating group over the top. But this was never envisioned as a tool for hedge fund activists, for the reasons you stated. Yep. And uh, to, um, um, this is Stephen back in again. Um, um, uh, and you're absolutely right, everyone. That uh, you, know, you know, it's actually a tool if implemented that's uh, uh, difficult to use or at least cumbersome. And that's actually the the, the design. And it's not simply about how many shares that you own and actually uh, you know, getting up to that percentage of three percent, um, uh, which is usually going to be done. Typically, will be done through a group. And with the nuance is uh, in the play on proxy access. Is there different people who have the no more than 20, maybe 25 shareholders can form a group, or and there's a push to and with shareholder proposals to move that number to unlimited number, and we'll see that for years to come with folks trying to push that number. But at the end of the day, uh, still to put a group together and get your largest act, your largest institutional investors to commit their shares unencumbered for the time it takes to to run a, a contest is actually a large undertaking, and so that point of having your board truly understand how this would work, I think uh, um, is helpful in getting them a little bit comfortable to, to simply implement uh, what they believe is sort of the best posture around this um, as opposed to continued fights on it. Um, well, there's the, other, the other thing, Steve, and I, I would just also say is that there's been some examples of companies that have adopted um, the proxy access proposal in order to um, uh, diffuse 
uh, a vote to adopt a form of uh, acting by written consent. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I would assume most of the folks listening on this call will understand what acting, uh, shareholders, the ability of shareholders to act by written consent is. Um, that is uh, something that most companies that don't have it don't want to have uh, to adopt if they don't have to. And it does seem that most institutions are willing to not support shareholder proposals for the adoption of uh, acting by written consent if a company has put in place a meaningful proxy access proposal. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Um, so, uh, in, in moving on, I should just note that uh, from a, a, a logistic standpoint, uh, we don't have any slides. So, we're we're asking you to rely on your only sense here today is is your hearing sense, uh, and we don't have any visuals. Um, so, we'll try to be as colorful with our language here. Um, so proxy access obviously um, hasn't been an event in the last few years, and it was this year. Uh, your traditional governance issues from declassifying boards to majority voting to written consent to the ability of shareholders to call a special meeting um, they're continued. Uh, we don't have to go through those numbers because those numbers are quite high in terms of their passage, um, and I think we'll see that for years to come, um, particularly as shareholders go down the capital list um, to more mid and small caps who have yet to adopt some of those features which are considered as better or best practices. Uh, but there was one issue that was sort of a surprise, uh, which I'd like to, uh, if, um, if Mark, you can start with, um, um, that uh, was sort of a core governance issue, which was that issue of um, uh, the ability um, to change bylaws that cropped up this year. Yep, thanks, Stephen. Um, I think what uh, what caught a lot of folks off guard uh, on, on the corporate side, uh, and it was primarily an issue with um, Maryland Incorporated REITs, but it did spill over into companies that were incorporated in a lot of non-Delaware jurisdictions uh, as well, that um, uh, Institutional Shareholder Services, ISS, had uh, uh, given warning and had adopted that uh, policies at the, the end of last year that for the 2017 proxy season, they would uh, be recommending a withhold vote on members of the NOMGov committee if uh, a company did not allow for uh, the shareholders to uh, also amend the bylaws and reserve that right just for, for, the, for the board itself. Um, and what, uh, I, I, you know, that sort of change, while um, I think ISS did give it, uh, you know, proper attention and, and warn folks, uh, still caught uh, many companies off guard when two weeks before the shareholder meeting, uh, an ISS report came out with with that as uh, you know with the recommendation against the the non-gov uh, members. Uh, so the the bad news was that uh, you know I think that there was a uh, in substantial increase in the number of companies that had greater than twenty percent of the shares voting against some members of the board. The number of directors that received less than 80 percent positive votes jumped dramatically this year from last year. Um, and the primary reason seems to be that policy change and that recommendation coming out of ISS. Having said that, um, what we also found uh, for those companies were that not every institution was following it, um, including several institutions that use ISS as a, as a resource and, and as a voting guide. Uh, so many institutions, many large mainstream institutions, uh, sort of were going to give companies a, 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 at least a year grace period before um, voting against directors for that reason. Um, and I also, you know, what we found was that when the ISS recommendation came out against members of the NOMGov committee, if the companies did outreach to their major institutions and told them that they would uh, be addressing it and addressing it in a positive way between the 2017 and 2018 shareholder meeting, most institutions were willing to um, give them the, the, the year grace period before withholding. Um, so I, I guess the, the takeaways are, um, you know, number one, if, if you just sort of did nothing and, and, and you were... A, subject to this uh, against recommendation from ISS, but did not uh, and will not be making any change uh, to your shareholders' ability to amend the bylaws, uh, you can expect actually a much higher withhold vote against 
the members of the NOMGOV committee and potentially spill over into other board members. Um, if you did engage with your shareholders and uh, uh, told them that you would be addressing it in the off season between the 2017 and 18 meeting, um, as I'm sure you would, make sure that that engage, you know, that those changes do take place, additional engagement if, if you think it's, if, if, if it's needed, uh, and make sure that that's explained thoroughly in your CDNA, not in your CDNA, but in your proxy next spring. Um, but I would say that that withhold against directors was a complete, not complete surprise, but a significant surprise to members of the corporate community and really uh, had a detrimental impact on a number of directors that uh, folks did not come seeing, did not see coming. Hey, Mark, Mark. It's, uh, Keith, I mean, it's a, ISS policy on this is pretty hard and fast. It's not like you could just in, adopt a supermajority um, amendment provision and say, okay, well, giving shareholders the right to amend, but you need to, it needs by super two thirds or, or more than a two thirds vote. Um, they were not, they were not taking any of that. They, they wanted, Basically, a simple majority of the votes cast standard in order in order to say that uh, they're not going to withhold. I, I think there were other factors. Um, well, I agree that that the whole the issue around ability to amend bylaws was a sore point. In general, shareholders seem to be growing more comfortable voting against directors. You you, you know you saw at Wells Fargo, for example, um, a handful of directors who who barely got majority support. And there were other companies um, where even um, mainstream investors voted against directors. And I think this is partly a natural evolution in shareholder empowerment. Institutional investors expect boards to be more responsive to their concerns. And they're, they're becoming simply more willing to vote against directors or withhold votes if engagement doesn't get results. In, indeed, indeed. Um, and if we so move to that to the next theme of um, which I, I, I believe if you're going to pick out of all the themes of this last proxy season, it was that the environmental and social proposals were directly at the forefront. Um, the, the 345 environmental and social proposals filed, about 201 social related, 144 environmental envi excuse me environmental related. Um, and looking at the environmental related ones. Um, you know, again, the number and the rise in the number of proposals uh, is not necessarily a surprise because that has been growing indeed for, for, for more than 10 years. You know, every year the number of uh, ENS proposals has grown. What was um, an important point uh, was the unprecedented, unprecedented level of support by shareholders of those proposals. Um, and if we take in particular, uh, of interest, the uh, climate change proposals, three of them which were focused on uh, you know, calling for companies to report on the impact of climate change policies, including analysis of the impacts of the commitment to the 2%, excuse me, 2 degree Celsius scenario change, the Paris Accords, um, uh, at, at three companies uh, they passed. Uh, these proposals averaged 33% average support, which is up from last year, which was just 24%. Again, the three passing. Uh, and if I can open it up to our, our, our uh, panelists, um, the significance. You know, three big, three companies, the biggest one, uh, the most prominent, uh, ExxonMobil, where it passed. Occidental Petroleum was the other um, uh, other company it passed, and then another utility company, PPL, uh, they all passed there, um, and uh, it was due to uh, changes at the largest investors in their policies update. Uh, maybe we'll start with Amy. Sure, and that, that's right. These were all headline-grabbing events. Um, I think, as you mentioned, in Exxon, the vote went from 38% support in 2016 to 62% this year of uh, majority support. And it wasn't just in sustainability proposals or climate change. We also saw strong support for board diversity proposals. Um, you know, many were filed at companies to adopt, you know, a pol either to adopt a policy on board diversity or report on steps they were taking to increase it. Um, and two this year, one majority support with large majorities. In fact, one uh, filed by CalSTRS, the California State Teachers, at Hudson Pacific Properties asked which asked the board to report on the steps it was taking to foster greater diversity on its board, received an astounding 85% of the votes cast. Um, and I think 
you know, there's a lot going on here, but one, one trend seems to be, you know, public and labor pension funds and social funds have long been active supporters of climate change and board diversity proposals. What's new uh, is that mainstream asset managers, including the big um, indexers like Black, uh, BlackRock and Vanguard and, and State Street, are engaging actively with portfolio companies on these issues, and to a certain degree, they're flexing their voting muscle on these issues as well. Uh, State Street said in March that it would throw its weight behind gender diversity on boards, and it certainly did. It voted against the re-election of the chair or most senior member of the nomination committees, uh, nom nom and gov committees at 400 companies that had no women directors and had failed to make significant efforts toward that goal. BlackRock said it had it backed eight shareholder proposals this spring promoting gender diversity. In, in five of those cases, BlackRock also voted against the nominating committee chairman's re-election. And, you know, State Street, BlackRock, and Vanguard, you know, collectively, some say, um, you know, may have turned the tide at, at ExxonMobil this year, voting against management on that, on that proposal you referred to. Um, I just say one caution that they're, you know, they're still, for the most part, taking these on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, in um, its second quarter stewardship report, BlackRock made clear that its votes for climate risk proposals at Exxon and, and Occidental were exceptions that, you know, it was careful to note that 25 of the 27 companies it engaged with on climate change had demonstrated a sufficient willingness to continue to improve their disclosures, and, and so they didn't, they didn't think it warranted votes against management on that issue. Um, but this is, you know, there's a difference here. They're, they're actively engaging on, on climate change and, and sustainability and um, paying much more attention to uh, board quality and board diversity. Absolutely. And uh, so you mentioned board diversity, and, uh, and again, if, those, if we pick out out of the, uh, the hundreds of, of social and environmental proposals, you know, the, the, the two big headlines were the climate change proposal, um, um, and the board diversity proposals, because in the past, uh, those just did not get, uh, um, you know, sort of a, a respectable percentage um, to be talked about again and again, but they are winning this year. And uh, if I can privilege... And Stephen, I, I would just, as a practical point of view, um, for the, the, the listeners, uh, point out that this year, for the first time, um, as we worked with our, 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 our clients in engaging with shareholders, you know, it, it was not unusual, uh, like in every uh, season for the last several, to be engaging with the, sh the, the major shareholders on, like, say, on pay, for instance, or uh, equity plan uh, participation. But uh, in prepping and getting together the appropriate team from the company to have the call with the major investors, um, we actually always had those clients add somebody that could speak to environmental and social policies at the company, even if that was not necessarily initially on the agenda for the call, because in almost every engagement call that we had related to the proxy uh, this year, um, even if the topic was, say, on pay or, or, or uh, you know, a stock option proposal or, or something that, you know, uh, was a much more traditional proposal, the institutions would bring up on their own something related to environmental or social concerns. And, it, it, you know, either we would have the officer at the company that was tasked with that or make sure that the directors who would be on the call were briefed to be able to address those points of view. And that was new for 2017 or much more pronounced this year than it had been in any prior years. Uh, yes, indeed. And certainly uh, that's the takeaway uh, from this uh, trend on environmental and social um, as we are in August and we're going into the fall, uh, which is the period of uh, governance roadshows and the, the non-off-proxy uh, uh, no, season where um, investors have a little bit more, t more time to spend with, with management uh, or directors um, if they want to um, uh, sort of do engagement. Uh, now is the time for folks to really think about those two issues and how you would respond to them. Um, and that, I should say not only think about them, but as Mark pointed out, you're going to be asked, uh, even if it's not uh, a core agenda item that you had agreed upon beforehand, uh, according to Mark. Um, be before I move to activism and, and call on Keith, I just wanted to know, are there any other comments on uh, 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 board diversity or, or climate change? Yeah, Stephen, if I could just um, make sure. a prediction. I, I think that um, with respect to proxy access, I think the first time we see a campaign using the proxy access tool 
um, that that actually goes all the way, um, I think, is going to be on board diversity. I think that is where the institutions are going to are going to have their first test case. As you know, we're seeing State Street put out some statements recently on on its policy on board diversity. BlackRock's been vocal. I think that is going to be the place where you're going to see the first test case of the use of proxy access. Well, you know, I, 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 I think you're right, Keith, and um, if I can make this point uh, as, a, as a practice point um, in how to explain this or that point to a board, which is if you look at uh, past precedent, uh, if you look at climate change proposals, um, we know that they are much better written now. They are, uh, these proposals are, are written in the language of risk. Uh, and they're written so that it's very hard for the large institutional investors to not support them, um, uh, given their public stances on those issues. So if you take that and extrapolate what happened this year with uh, uh, in the board diversity space, if someone puts a proposal together in the years to come uh, 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 on proxy access related to board diversity, and they're putting together a diverse board candidates for a board that, that does not have board diversity, it will be a hard thing for large institutional investors not to be supportive of it, given the stances they have taken uh, in the last year and in the years to come. So I think you're absolutely right. It sort of follows that that would be, that would be the right space. And so the lesson, the takeaway would be that if you have proxy access, if you've adopted it, and you're a board that's not uh, particularly diverse, that has some issues in their vulnerability, now is probably the time to start thinking how to make yourself less vulnerable uh, I know companies, a lot of companies talk about how to make it so less vulnerable to activism. Uh, and that's, that's a regular discussion now. But I think they're also going to have to start talking about how to make themselves less vulnerable to proxy access because it's, it's clear that it's coming. The tool is going to get used. It wasn't adopted at 60% of the S&P 500 just to make a statement that companies now have proxy access. It's going to be used for something. Right. Um, and, again, another takeaway is that, while there were proposals put on the ballot this year, uh, and, they, and, and many more were successful this year and then in the past, there were proposals, and I think Amy mentioned this, that uh, were withdrawn because there were discussions and engagement and negotiations. And uh, it's important for folks that now is the time to figure out um, um, and how those discussions went um, and who got them with, withdrawn and, and, and what was the trigger to get them withdrawn and, and how to really do engagement right. Um, so speaking about doing engagement right, uh, if Keith, if you talk a little bit about what we saw in uh, hedge fund activism this year, uh, we know it's still uh, an active play. As a matter of fact, it's uh, no more, it's n not a niche. You know, it's, it's sort of a, a mainstream uh, strategy, which a lot of people are getting into. Um, and they're new activists and they're old time activists. I'm going out after bigger targets, uh, Keith. Yeah, thank you, um, Stephen. It, and uh, I know Mark, you'll, you'll chime in. Uh, but you know, when, when we started, when we, we had this discussion in the in the preview version of this webinar, and we were trying to think about what was going to happen this proxy season. And one of the wild cards was we've got a new administration, a new cabinet, new policies, someone new at the SEC, and and we. We also had a, a stock market that was already um, on its way up significantly. Markets just about 22,000 uh, today, and whether or not those factors were going to, in any way, um, adversely affect activism was was that going to was this going to be new? Is this we going to see less activism this year because because the market is is at a relatively healthy healthy valuation, if not historic highs, and and yet it, it really did not adversely affect activism at all, and we had a, a very busy season, uh, particularly uh, in the U.S., and if you look at Activist Insights um, numbers, uh, their stats uh, that are uh, recently out for the, the first half of the year, uh, you see a little reduction in the U.S., but I'm not sure it's statistically um, relevant, statistically significant, about 320 campaigns year-to-date in 2017, down from 338. Uh, what we don't know is, I mean, because they're tracking public uh, public demands by activists, and they don't know of all the situations that, that happen. Um, and I will tell you that there have been a number of situations that, that I've been involved in, I'm sure Mark has too, where 
uh, year to date, uh, there hasn't been any public disclosure. It it got resolved quietly, and I think the, you're seeing a lot of those situations where companies and boards are are engaging, and and so there there are demands being made, uh, but we're not we're not hearing about them. And, and I think the area where you're probably not hearing about them often is uh, in the large cap, and so large cap activism is is up um, again. Going back to Activist Insight stats, you know, year to date. Uh, large cap, more than 10 billion. Uh, year to date, 2016 was was 22.2 percent, and uh, year to date, uh, 2017 is 26.2 percent of activist demands were at large cap companies. And while that that looks like a, a relatively small increment, um, uh, I, large cap companies is an area because uh, because of the size of the companies, a lot of activists don't need to file a 13D because they don't have 5%. And I think there's those stats under probably under-report the number of activist situations at large-cap uh, companies uh, that are happening. I mean, I think that you're still probably three-quarters of activism, um, which is about 73%, is, is happening in the, in the small-cap sector. But what we, I think there's a large number of large cap situations uh, that we're not hearing about because they're they're getting resolved. Uh, we're obviously hearing about the situations like uh, Whole Foods and Jana. Uh, we're hearing about the Procter and Gamble, Tryan, and other situations like that. Those are are attracting uh, headlines. But I, I think certainly in the large cap, there's going to be more uh, activist uh, activity, um, but also a lot of activity that we we may not hear about, depending on how um, how it gets resolved. Um, one noticeable trend this year is, and, and this played out very publicly, um, particularly uh, in the in the large caps, uh, was activists being much more bold about going after uh, the uh, CEO um, at the get go. So often that they might want to replace the CEO as part of the the end game of their campaign, but. But not so be, be so public about it um, uh, in their in their communications and in their dialogue with the institutions. And we saw this year a number of situations, uh, iconic Buffalo Wings, CSX play out, where the activists activists were very public about their concerns uh, about uh, the CEO. Um, notwithstanding how healthy the the market has been, as I mentioned, the stock market uh, uh, M and A played a very prominent role um, in activism, and, and there has been uh, some press coverage recently um, on, on the role that M&A has played, the significant role that it's played uh, in activist situations uh, over, over the past uh, proxy season. I think the most, most obvious one, most noticeable, may be the role that Jana Partners played in the sale of uh, Whole Foods to, uh, to Amazon. Uh, likely that that transaction may never have happened without the uh, uh, an activist in in, in the stock, um, and so I think we're going to continue to see um, a, an increased role of of M and A uh, used by uh, by activists uh, because it is the easiest way for an activist uh, to get a um, enhancement of shareholder value, assuming it's a company that that has a uh, as, a, as an available buyer. And then uh, one more trend uh, to note is that we're continuing to see lots of, of newcomer activists. Um, I wouldn't say these are all newly organized hedge funds, 30-somethings just deciding they want to they form an activist fund and go out and raise capital. But we're also seeing a number of funds that were historically uh, passive and were, were not uh, filers historically of 13 Ds um, that are now uh, filing their first 13 Ds and going and dipping their toes in the activist world and um, and having some success at doing that and, and we, we probably will see more historically passive funds and I'm not talking about the big big institutions I'm talking about smaller smaller funds but funds that that were not necessarily organized at the get-go to be uh, activist funds. We see them more being taking activist positions um, and, uh, and, and getting some success and getting changes and getting, and getting directors on, uh, on boards. 
And, and, and one of, if, if uh, because I'm combining, um, you know, the, the trend and what the takeaway is um, for a matter of time, uh, one of the take one of the takeaways um, is, uh, you know, so what to do um, in this spirit of activism that's uh, obviously going to continue, um, and we've also so settlements, as you mentioned, uh, continue, and that's a consideration um, about when to settle, and, and institutional investors have been quite vocal this year about uh, companies settling too quickly, so if, if anyone wants to talk about that. That's uh, uh, true. That's true. Um, yeah, and I would just say one of the takeaways, I'm sorry, I'll just make it quick because I think you have probably more to say about this, but I think given the resurgence of hedge fund activism, engaging your investors and making sure your corporate strategy is crystal clear to them is a must, and that, that extends through to making sure you're clear on why the settlement was a good deal for your company. Um, I think you'll find some of your in, in larger investors, you know, are, are uncomfortable about being left in the dark and aren't sure, you know, there was a good deal there. So. Uh, that clarity in your disclosures or in your conversations with your investors, you know, needs to be needs to be very sharp and very on point. Mark, yeah, I, 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 Keith had made a point just as he was talking about activism about the the new administration and how that was going to impact, or there was there was some wonder, wondering about how that was going to impact uh, as. People in the activist space, like Keith and Amy and I, actually the, the bigger administration administration change wasn't so much of what was going on in Washington D.C. and at the White House, but what was going on at ISS, which was that the uh, the fellow that had headed up the the group that is the ISS group that analyzes proxy contests and contested mergers, Chris Cernich, uh left ISS and actually joined me and as my partner. And uh, one of the folks that was uh, in his group, uh, Christiana Guerra, took over that role. Um, and there was, I believe, uh, f from talking with clients both on the corporate side and folks that are uh, activists, there was some uh, con debate and, and, and wondering, you know, with the changing of the uh, leadership there on at ISS on the proxy fight side result in uh, sort of a different point of view and a different application of policy at ISS when it came to contests. I think the, the quick answer is that it's a continuation of the same sort of thoughtful process that ISS has been engaged in, which in, is whether there's, a, uh, you know, whether the dissidents have made a case for that new ideas are needed on the board and that the dissidents themselves have put forward uh, ideas that you know, deserve merit and potential board representation. The, the upshot of which is that at least in half the occasions, ISS has been and still does recommend for dissidents, uh, which sometimes comes as a shock to the corporate community who, who tend to view activist hedge funds as, as not really having new ideas and retreading uh, ideas that the company themselves had considered and rejected. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to point out for the folks that haven't had the pleasure of actually having to deal with an activist or go through a proxy contest that the, even though you've been uh, probably getting uh, good scores and, and, and uh, recommendations for your board every year from ISS, if you were to deal with an activist, you actually are dealing with a, 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 a dedicated community, a dedicated group of analysts within ISS whose job it is to uh, review proxy fights and talk to both the company and the dissidents before issuing reports. And if you were to move on then to this sort of trend towards whether settlements are happening too quickly or not, I, I, I do think uh, obviously there's been quite a bit of reporting uh, from uh, the fact that some of the institutions have felt uh, that uh, settlements sort of take away their ability to decide who's on the board and that these deals get cut in back rooms and back offices and then the, these new directors are, are sort of being forced upon the institutional shareholders who should have been able to actually vote up or down. Uh, I think that that concern has been not entirely, but seems to be most um, uh, vocally being uh, put forward by the, uh, the index funds, who obviously do control a lot of votes and have governance groups who spend a lot of time uh, deciding in contests as well as regular annual meetings uh, how the shares are going to get voted. I think some of the active managers, I don't want to speak for every one of them, are a little bit more comfortable that settlements uh, are 
probably the right business decision in most cases and, and avoid the, 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 the time and the, and the dollars that the companies have to spend in defending uh, uh, the, the, uh, the fights. I do, do just want to add that this year, to my knowledge, it was the first time that post-settlement you actually had some institutional pushback on uh, the election of one of the directors that joined the board uh, as a result of a settlement, and, and that was in uh, NRG, um, a company that uh, engaged, uh, Elliot took a position in, and had some engagement, and as a result of, of that engagement uh, and uh, generally just sort of reviewing the members of the board, added a couple of nominees that Elliot had put forward, and some of the institutions uh, had some issues, at least with one of the nominees and their views on uh, potential views on climate change, et cetera. And there was a little bit of pushback, and ISS did ultimately recommend for that nominee at the regular annual meeting. But that could be a trend towards seeing greater institutional uh, pushback towards settled uh, directors coming on as a result of settlement. And, and you know, you, it might be the case where you see down the road even ISS recommending against some of those directors uh, as not the best fits for the company, even though they resulted from a settlement. Before, I'm, I'm going to move into the subject of multi-class and virtual annual meetings, but before we, we move off the activism, uh, let me just ask a question that has come, that has come across from the audience uh, and, and look for a short answer. Do you think that traditionally, traditional actively managed mutual funds will be engaging in more activism to generate alpha in their portfolios to better compete with low-cost, Passive index funds. So, will the traditional actively managed mutual funds uh, be engaging in, in in more activism to uh, create alpha? And uh, we know, um, even though we talk about Whole Foods, Newberger, Berman, actually was very active there, and, and basically had a uh, what I what I term an RFP for an activist to come in, uh, in which they are, that RFP was accepted by Jana. Um, um, and I think, uh, as Keith, you said, had a lot to do with um, Whole Foods making the decision that, that it did. Well, my, my short answer to that uh, would be that it, it's, it's not likely uh, to become a trend. And, and the reason is that most mutual funds are not organized with the resources to, to run a proxy fight or an activist campaign, that they're, they're, they're organized to not only on the, on the sell side, uh, to get to gather investors and gather money, and then they're they're organized to have top quality portfolio managers and stock pickers and and, and folks who know how to balance the portfolio. Uh, the idea that they're going to start recruiting people to run activist campaigns because that's a whole nother uh, you know skill set. I I think is is just not like I, I just don't see it happening. Okay. And. Um um, and, and those who, who do get involved uh, do find out that it's, it's easier said than done, um, and it takes a lot of effort to do. Can I move, Amy, to you to talk about uh, uh, multi-class, which is a, is a big issue and some headlines made uh, uh, today by the S&P 500 index? Yes, thank you. Um, in fact, yes, S&P announced that it would ban new multi-class companies from its key stock indexes. And this move means that, that SNAP and other new companies with share classes that have differential or no voting rights will be barred from being included in the S&P 500, the, you know, the S&P mid-cap 400, and the S&P small-cap 600. Um, at CII, we, we view this as a huge win for investors and a blow to companies that deny shareholders any say in how the company is run. And it, this comes less than a week after FTSE Russell's preliminary decision to bar SNAP and companies with virtually zero voting rights in the hands of public shareholders from being included in the Russell 3000 and other FTSE Russell indexes. You know, we, we um, CII and a lot of our investor members were very concerned when we saw SNAP IPO with no vote shares and um, other young companies, including Blue Apron and Altice USA, going public with triple class share structures and included a class of non-voting stock and reserve. We lobbied the index providers to, um, for public consultations, um, seeking comment on whether uh, no vote share should be included, and we're, we're really pleased with the outcome at both, and we hope that MSCI um, takes, a similar, takes similar steps. We haven't given up on dual-class companies um, in general. Um, all, you know, it's not just about non-voting shares, not share classes. There's also sort of a... Um, growing fascination with, with multi-class companies generally, particularly with hot IPO companies. And, 
you know, when a company goes to the capital markets to raise money from the public, we think public investors are entitled to certain protections and basic rights, and that includes the right to vote that's proportional to size the company's, the investor's holdings. Um, so, you know, we will, we, we did petition the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ years ago to bar new listings of multi-class companies, and um, the, the debate's kind of moved on since then. I, I think that's gonna, that is a challenge, but I, I do think we're seeing folks meet in the middle around appropriate sunset provisions, and we're, we're looking at that also. I, I know a lot of our members um, are talking about that, so we hope that there's some way to, to move this forward by ensuring that if companies do come to market or do get listed with um, dual class or, or triple class shares, that, that there's an, a built-in, you know, there's a bylaw, there's a built-in provision to sunset those, and, you know, we would think not, it shouldn't be a long sunset either. Right. But we well, think that's I, the focus I, of debate. I, I think this is an issue in the coming years that we're going to hear more and more about, and as if there is jurisprudence on this, uh, if there, there, there are lawsuits, um, uh, there's some particular issues around business judgment rule being uh, being afforded or not afforded, I think it will become very interesting. Now, if I can move very quickly to um, uh, virtual annual, annual meetings, and uh, that was one of our first questions that, that we had from someone of whether investors are warming up to the idea of having uh, – Virtual meetings only, so no physical meeting, uh, but uh, doing it virtually. Um, and if I could start with Amy, um, you know, are folks warming? Are, are investors warming up to that? I don't know if investors are. It cer certainly seems that companies are. Um, there's a you know a trend of increasing number. It's still quite small, but there's a growing number. I think it's the number of estimated about 255 virtual shareholder meetings this year. Um, most of those were um, not hybrid meetings, meaning they were just virtual only, and some of those, a lot of them were just audio only, not video. I, shareholders continue to deserve, we think, the, the choice to attend meetings in person. And, you know, we get that companies are concerned about the cost, but we, we do think that companies can, you know, can and, and should keep costs, the cost component down without eliminating the in-person um, aspect altogether, and they, you know, you, you can hold a, an in-person meeting in your corporate headquarters. There's no need to serve food or beverages or pass out swag bags. Um, but we, you know, we do think that virtual technology is welcome if it enhances the ease of attendance and the quality of the meeting, but not if it if it um, puts a lock on who can participate by being virtual only. Indeed, and I think this is something which we'll see, uh, perhaps see more private ordering on, um, because the SEC, at least in its uh, no-action request this year uh, uh, to one company, um, said it's, it's uh, you know, they excluded a proposal that it was asking to ban uh, um, the determination of, of um, having uh, a virtual only, uh, and that was deemed as an ordinary business that the company gets to make that decision. Uh, but just because you're allowed to do something doesn't necessarily mean that shareholders are going to go along with it. So that, this might be another area where, pr where private ordering uh, might take um, uh, might take might take the lead here. And if we can end with, uh, we would be remiss if we didn't have a discussion, uh, a very short discussion. The fact that we have a, a new SEC chair, and uh, before the chair came in, we had uh, proposals uh, in, in the legislature from the Choice Act uh, to others. Um, uh, aimed at uh, um, the shareholder proposal rule, and so if we, if we could talk about where where that is um, and the future of the shareholder proposal rule is being debated, so if we can give some update and some insight into what people think about the future of uh, the shareholder proposal rule uh, will be, and um, um, to the best, uh, if it's if it's worthwhile, some uh, uh, thoughts about uh, what we should see from this uh, new SEC. Um, well, Stephen, this is Amy. I'll just take a stab at the short proposal rule. You know, it, it, provisions were in the Choice Act that, um, to raise the threshold for filing proposal to ridiculous heights and for resubmission. Um, we think there's been such an investor outcry about this, it's not likely to reappear on the Senate side in, in legislation that might go to the Senate next year, but we're not counting on it. Um, we, we also think there'll probably be a continuing pressure from the business community for the SEC to reopen Rule 14A8, and um, we do think that if it's going to be reopened, it should be done at the SEC. That's where um, 
we have a lot of confidence in the SEC's ability to, to be inclusive and get views from everyone. We don't think change is needed, but um, we would not be surprised if there were, you know, the SEC were to host roundtables on this topic in the, near, in the future. Sure. And, and, and with that, because we're at the top of the hour, let me just go around and I'll end with you, Amy, and, and, and we'll probably start with Keith. Um, some of the takeaways, uh, Keith, and then to, to Mark, um, some of the takeaways you have that you think uh, folks should to think about uh, as they go into this proxy off-season in the fall and think about engagement and gearing up um, for 2018. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, I think we're still going to see um, – substantial amounts of shareholder activism in 2018, even if the market continues to climb to set new record highs. I think uh, we're, we're going to still see uh, uh, more activism in 2018 uh, than we saw in 2017, even if it's not shown uh, by the numbers because a lot more situations are, are resolved. And we're going to continue to see um, boards um, – being much more proactive, uh, and they were proactive this past season uh, in in preparing for and trying to make themselves uh, less vulnerable uh, to activists by by doing by being thoughtful about their governance, thoughtful about communicating the strategy, some of the things Amy said before, and and thoughtful uh, about um, about their board composition. So I think we're going to continue to see more proactive steps, uh, even as activists climbs higher in 2018. Mark? If the first time you're in, engaging with the governance uh, decision makers, the, the voting people at your institution is after a 13D has been filed, then you've lost the proxy contest. Um, you, you need, as a company, to be thinking about getting senior members of management or even board members in front of the major institutional governance departments. Um, it, it's, you know, Number one, it, it creates that sort of level of dialogue and trust, and, and, and now the institution gets to know what, what the directors are thinking and how they engage with the management, et cetera. Don't wait till there's an actual activist in your stock, because by that point, it's probably going to, you know, it's going to be too late to change opinions to be in your favor. That would be my takeaway. And before I get to Amy, let me just say that uh, I've been able to get some of the questions in during the due course, and if there are other questions, uh, now is your, your 30 seconds to type it in uh, so we can get them in. Uh, but Amy, with, uh, uh, following your last words, uh, I'll have a couple of last words, and if there are questions, any more questions, uh, we'll deal with them. So uh, okay. Amy, Boris, sure. please. I'll be very quick because I agree with the comments that my colleagues have made. Um, I would just say that companies that have no women directors or directors of color have no excuse. Your biggest shareholders are running out of patience, and it's, you know, there's a lot of these companies, and if your company is one of them, it has a lot of work to do, and it should do it now. Now is the time to, to tackle that problem long before your next uh, annual meeting. Yeah, indeed, and, and, and uh, let me follow with, with, with my comments, which was a, uh, I know we got a comment or a question, it's more of a comment than a question about um, uh, the linking of proxy access to board diversity, and uh, if you don't have a diverse board, um, and that the advice should be how to, you know, in, instead of how to make your board less vulnerable to proxy access, um, to your board should be diverse because it's good business and good governance. And my response to that is uh, absolutely. But as advisors, whether you're an external advisors, as those who are on the phone, uh, as panelists or, or others who are internal advisors uh, inside of the C-suite, uh, you know your client. Um, and some of your clients, some of your board members um, can be persuaded by um, um, the business case around board diversity. It's been made time and time again. And there are others who, who um, for one reason or another, are, are not convinced, um, but they do get convinced when they're hit overhead with a crisis, uh, uh, be it related to um, a large investor uh, voting no on the, nom in the entire nom and gov committee um, uh, or, or a hedge fund managers coming in um, and, and uh, attacking the board based on their board composition. So as internal advisors, you know your client best, um, your board members best, and, and, and how, how they are moved, and some are moved by um, doing what's right and good for the business, um, and there are others who um, eventually do what's right and good for the business because they're moved for some other reason. 
um, uh, through, through, um, through an attack. Um, but uh, you know your client best, and uh, I think what we were talking about today is uh, different avenues of providing that advice to getting your client to yes. Um, because as Amy said, um, uh, you, the, the only natural predators that directors have happen to be investors. And the investment community um, have made several proclamations this year around diversity, and they've made it on, on climate change and some other issues. Um, that um, uh, but that will lead to what's going to happen in next proxy season. And I, I should also say that the issues that we didn't talk about, which are in in between climate change and board diversity, whether it's wage disparity, gender parity, um, there's a new human capital coalition out there of investors who have submitted a rule-changing proposal, which um, in this new SEC probably won't get the light of day, but the issues that are inside of, of that proposal are, again, should be looked at as canaries in the coal mine um, around the need for investors to want to know more about how you're thinking and treating your supply chain um, and your employees. Um, are, are good things for folks to gather information on and think about during the proxy off season to prepare for 2018. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining me on this uh, August afternoon. Uh, we know it's August, uh, but it's August 1st. It's not, we're not deep into August yet. So um, I, I thank everyone for joining us. I thank our panelists. Uh, I appreciate it, making, making your time available. And uh, we're very happy to provide this uh, update and review of the proxy season. And with that, I bid you a good afternoon. Thank you. This does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a wonderful day.